Hi, this is Coach Redpill, and I'm here joined with Faith Goldie, uh, late of Rebel Media, now an independent journalist. Uh, Faith, it's a pleasure having you on. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's, it's a delight, really. Look, you have become a bit of a cult heroine uh, among the, the alt-right uh, and, and the dissident right, and everybody sort of like right of the center thinks that you're just terrific. You were there in, uh, in, in Charlottesville, and you've been uh, quite a vocal and a strong advocate for our side of the, of the narrative, as it were. Now, I just wanted to talk to you first. What do you think are the interesting problems going on right now? And just want to just, what are you interested in now? What are you focused on at this time? Absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks very much for the compliment. I know that there are a lot of folks who certainly, you know, disavow and don't see me as alt-right, and I certainly don't identify necessarily as that, but just the mere fact that I refuse to counter-signal them until I'm blue in the face, I think, is what's earned me perhaps a, a couple of, you know, points in their camp and the fact that I'm interested in rational debate and to talk about some of these edgy and taboo issues and, and I think that's healthy, that's normal and I certainly don't want to continue to push young white men to the fringes of society because they'll just fester there in the gutters. I think they've got real issues and I'd like to talk about them. Um, quite outside of that, what interests me today? Well, I think in this post-Trumpian um, uh, North American and just right-wing landscape, what we're seeing right now is a complete um, I don't want to say an as existential crisis, but we're certainly willing now that we've got the power to wade into the more uncomfortable um, factions and and to see what we what we believe and what we don't believe and why. Because I think Donald J. Trump, the fact that he came out and did things like you know counter signal free trade, which was such an anathema to how rhinos, how these conservative ink folks had run their game going forward, and they had this economic nationalism. Well, we thought, well, if that's um, fair game for debate than other things are too. And then of course we had either through the media or through our um, popular kind of uh, populist grassroots movement, there was this, this implication that within Donald Trump's messaging was this implicit appeal to the white vote. And folks started saying, well, hey, you know, there might've been just a few points of difference between Hillary and, and Donald, but when you broke it down along ethnic or racial lines, well, holy smokes, there were landslides in either direction. And considering the fact that the um, face of the average American, average Canadian for that matter, are changing going forward, how is this going to affect our political calculus? You know, California wasn't always blue and Texas is not always going to be red. And, and what does this all mean? And, and so all of this, I think, has led to a deep introspection happening on the right about, okay, where are we and what are we about? And I think that this current chapter that we're in within this almost uh, a rejigging of our manifesto, if you will, is is really this line uh, between the civic nationalists and the, I'm really hesitant to use the word ethno-nationalists because people all of a sudden want to be like, white nationalism, the ethno state. Um, but I, I like the idea of at least uh, like, uh, talking about things like our European heritage and traditional sources of immigration and, and this idea of basically values versus identity and where do people fall. And it's led to some fascinating debate and I know it certainly expanded my own horizons when it comes to um, political philosophy and projections going forward. Yeah, because my thinking is that, well, it, right now it seems clear that we're having two basic factions on the right, on, on the dissident right, the, the non-GOP, non-corporatist right. And the two factions seem to be the alt-light, which is basically civic nationalist, and the mm -hmm. alt-right, or those who are sympathetic to the alt-right, uh, who are more ethno-nationalist. That is, they believe that a certain group of people, uh, basically they are identity politics uh, on the side of uh, non-minorities. Uh, a lot of people have said that Donald Trump was the first time that whites in the United States voted along ethnic lines. And the whites almost self-consciously decided to vote for Donald Trump. And the, and the numbers were staggering. You know, Among mm -hmm. women, white women, it was, what, 58% voted for Trump against 41% for Hillary and, and so on. And among men, it was even higher. And uh, among different age groups and all the rest of it. And it seems as if identity politics has finally come home to roost, whereby everybody is devoted along, uh, divided rather, along the lines of ethnicity. Now, my thinking is that... Uh, in a democracy, you need the biggest tent possible in order to win, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is that now with the immigration, the multiculturalism, there is no 
one ethnic group that really has a clear-cut majority that can overwhelm any of every other side. So how are we going to move forward in this landscape politically? I mean, what, what are you thinking? Are you thinking that the right has to go full ethno-nationalist or is there some sort of civic nationalism to be had? I mean, what's your thinking? What's your thinking? Right. So first of all, I, I, I disagree with one of your points with respect to there is no clear majority because right now in both the United States and Canada, there is a okay. clear that's, majority that's, and there is a white majority and, yeah. and it is going to be changing. So I think for a lot of people, there's this idea of now or never. If we are going to appeal to white identity politics and group interests, and I know you, you want to correct yourself there and say yes, yeah. okay, I get that. Okay, so 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 I think that's why there is timeliness certainly plays into this debate. This is not a debate that we're looking to achieve over the next four generations. It's basically within this generation or never at all. Right. And with respect to the distinction of of what's going on, and you know, it's a bunch of ethnic groups. I think really the dividing line between the alt light and the alt right or the distant right, which is a term that I prefer to use, mm -hmm. um, is this idea of the collective versus the individual and and I think that while the individual and individualism is an enlightenment ideal and of course was a, a torch that was first you know uh, found and then bequeathed by Europeans largely white Europeans um, what has happened in the post neo-marxist cultural Marxist um, West has been a a return to collectivism Right. And and trying to operate as an individual in a world of collectives is frankly suicide wish. Right. And and people are starting to wake up to that. I mean, you needn't. I just recently posted a video to my um, to my channel, and it basically explored certain things like affirmative action policies, non discrimination policies within my country, and they exist virtually everywhere in the West where everyone was seen as a group and everyone's groups were offered certain protections, political, politically enshrined, legally enshrined protections, except for the white male, except right. for the, even the white female to a degree. Yeah. And so all of a sudden you say, well, hold on a second, because these policies that tell me how I'm supposed to operate my land, how I'm supposed to operate my business also enshrine implicitly and in some cases explicitly now with certain court rulings, um, the, the exclusion of all of those beautiful rights and privileges and protections of, of my particular group. And so all of a sudden the idea of the individual becomes, well, it's just me. I'm yeah. the only individual and the rest of you guys are cool. Yeah. And so now there's, I think there's this movement of, well, if, if they're not going to play by our rules, you're, you're coming to this individualistic, this, 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 this enlightened, you know, post enlightenment, post Renaissance sort, sort of Western world. And, and, and you're not going to play by our rules. Well then hell, I'm going to smarten up and start playing by yours. Yeah, I, I completely agree about the whole issue of special rights and, and certain protected classes because it essentially creates an aristocracy, which is, of course, what we want to avoid. But an aristocracy is basically a class of people who have certain rights and privileges that other groups or the rest of the society does not have. And they have these rights by virtue of their birth. We tend to think of aristocracies as dukes and queens and what have you. But, uh, you know, a black person who is going to get a better position in a university or a better position in so far as government contracts merely by the fact of his race. Well, that mm -hmm. is an aristocrat within a society, which is anathema to democracy or the representative democracy that we've grown up with and that we, we seek to uh, uh, create. So wouldn't it be better to fight against these aristocratic laws as opposed to everybody collectivizing? That is rather than trying for everybody to be a, a, a protecting their own class of people that is Catholics and whites and, and men and what have you and blacks and uh, Asians and Latino wouldn't be better to abolish any kind of preferential t treatment across the board for the society to go in that direction? I would argue that you have to collectivize in order to wage that war, which is to say the same way that the NAACP or whatever, all these different, yeah. right, all these different organizations exist in order to secure and indeed expand um, uh, in-group interests. Well, whites have to do the same thing. Europeans have to do the same thing. Um, otherwise, I mean, one guy might fight a court case. Guess what's hap going to happen? He's going to lose. We saw the same thing happen over here in Canada. There was a um, a scholarship set up for white straight men. Right. That was that was that was shut down immediately because yeah. no family is going to be like, I'm going to go to with the government and try to make sure that this last will and testament 
is is upheld. But if there was a group that said, hey, we're here for European and heterosexual and Catholic or whatever interests, and guess what? We've got the funds, we've got the bank, uh, the, the, we can bankroll this. We've already collectivized and we've got this, this war chest and we've got a legal team and we can help enshrine these protections for you that really don't make you any better than anyone else. Don't give you a leg up on anyone else. It just allows you a level playing field considering the terrain that we have now been handed in this multicultural, multi-ethnic, we stand for nothing society. And, and circling back to this, this idea of the alt-light versus the alt-right, if it really is about values versus identity, I think that that is a little bit of a misnomer because I worry that the common and shared values that we're supposed to all be rallying around are bogus. I don't believe that there is this moral civic consensus that we're supposed to believe in. I think that following uh, the eradication of, frankly, um, a, a Christianity, as much as it used to play a role in the public sphere, and, and following um, the disintegration of some sort of homogeneity in, in our society, it's led to a breakdown of this civic consensus. And so with a breakdown of that civic consensus, specifically in my country, where we see things like M103, and if any of your audience has not looked into it, this is, I mean, as sinister as it gets, this is literally Sharia law coming yeah. in in the form of a motion where that shalt not offend the the prophet you know yeah. islamophobia is against it, the law yeah yeah and it, it, it's it's anti-democratic it's anti-liberal values it's anti-western values but all of a sudden no multiculturalism that's one of the values we're supposed to rally around so it gets a little bit hazy for me and i don't truly believe that you can have a civic value oriented society without having the bedrock the anchor being its national identity I, I see exactly your point. I, just before I move on to to continue with this conversation, which is fascinating, I just want to step back a little bit and and explain to the audience, perhaps, and and get your opinion on the following. My thinking is that this discussion between what is what I informally call alt right, alt light, this difference, is because it is clear that in the United States, at least, the corporatist right is on its last legs, because it mm -hmm. is too beholden to the moneyed interest, the oligarchy. Uh, in the United States, people don't really talk about the oligarchy, but it's no different than an oligarchy in Russia or, or any other third world country. Because it really is pathetic where the uh, companies have legal permission to uh, buy politicians and get whatever they want from, from politicians. There was a Citizen United decision. There was the McDonald decision by the Supreme Court. Both of those decisions in 2014 and 2016, respectively, essentially made it legal to, number one, have companies pay buy as much uh, as many candidates as they want to, and number two, for people to essentially pay off politicians so long as there was not a direct quid pro quo, which is, you know, it just opens the door for legalized bribery. So my thinking is that the Republicans and the conservatives realize that the, conserv that the Republican Party is no longer a party of the people, but a party of the corporations. And it seems to me that this whole internal in internecine fight that's going on between the alt-right and the alt-light and, and everybody in between, civic nationalism, ethno-nationalism, is because whoever wins is going to eventually gain control of the Republican Party machine and start to feel the candidates who will win, okay? Of course, Let's, and, and- Go ahead. And I think we have in large part, whether people want to admit it or not, we have in large part uh, Steve Bannon to thank for that. He yeah. was the one who was so committed to not just waging a war on the Democrats, but also against Republicans as well. These rhinos, these conservative angst, these people who are not putting America first, who are putting foreign interests for, first, who are putting corporate America's interests before, you know, Wall Street as opposed to Main Street. And, and, and that's, I think, all a byproduct of where this identity politics that has experienced excluded mainstream America has led us, which is to say, it's all about these boutique breaks. It's all about these boutique I interests. It's all about these, these very micro-targeted, you know, ethnic vote-seeking practices, but we kind of forgot about where the majority was, and these people don't feel good about it. That's why you see an opioid, opioid crisis, I mean, booming across yeah. America. Over the past 100 years, everybody is living longer, except for the middle-class, white American, middle-aged man. Guess yeah. what? The highest suicide of, rate. Yeah, death of despair. It's like in certain jurisdictions, especially across middle America, I mean, these guys, their their emergency room rates are in the three or four hundred percent spike range yeah. because of the fact that these guys are like they, they it does, uh, what what it means to be man and woman doesn't count anymore. What it means to be mother and father doesn't count anymore. You're you're excluded from the workplace because your skin color is not the same. You're not disabled enough. You know, you're you're not you're not gender bicurious, whatever the heck enough. You know. <laughs> 
Uh, everywhere in society you see that portrayals of people like you who have the same frankly genitalia and skin color are shown to be these effeminate men who either in in homosexual relationships or getting beat up by their female I, I mean that not not literally but 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 getting pushed around by their their female counterparts who are the ones who are exuding these typically male characteristics and traits of corporal daring and and, and hard bodied sexuality and, and, and physical conquest and monetary conquest and so, so, so it's like, well, yeah, no bleep there, Sherlock. The, these guys don't feel good about it, and so they want change. And the easiest way to create change, culture takes a long time, education takes a long time, Hollywood takes a long time. It's politics. And so Donald Trump and Steve Bannon were, were the first to domino, and now we're seeing in, in all of these primaries, these challengers are doing all right. Yeah. And I, I think that this is scaring the living daylights out of conservative ink because they didn't they didn't they can't equip, control they it. didn't well and this is the thing though and this is going to maybe be a little bit edgy but anyone who's familiar with history will, will know that this is just a case and this is why i actually went to charlottesville because i know when there are disaffected white men that organize history can change itself yeah it's just the way that that, that it's gone in the western yeah. world it has. And so, and so, by by trying to suppress the white male by saying you're nothing, you should feel guilty, you should not identify with anything, not yourself, not your people, not your culture. We thought we were going to shut them down. Well, guess what? All of a sudden, they're like, mm, not so quick, bud. Yeah. We're we're going to throw you out of office. We're going to throw you out of our classrooms, and and we're going to throw you out of our media. The media itself is crumbling right now, which is why you know stations like your own are doing so well. And so it's been really, really, it's been it's been in a way edifying, and that's why, frankly, I'm so white pilled. About the whole thing is because we're taking steps in the right direction. Okay, white pilled is hopeful. Is that the new, right. nomenclature? That's okay, right. just, That's just right. to be clear about that. Just call me Coach White Pill. <laughs> my, my my concern, my concern is that it might it might be too little, too late. On the one hand, it might be mm. on the other hand that um, you know a lot of people buy into this stuff. I mean, educated people, people who should know better, buy into this uh, multicultural bullshit. And, and they are not willing to overthrow the establishment. And so, and also there's an obvious problem that regardless of what you've, uh, if you voted for Trump or not, there is the widespread uh, perception among a lot of people that they don't want to follow him, even though he, uh, you know, espouses sort of like the, 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 the anti-establishment ethos that a lot of people feel, but they don't. I mean, I can, I'll be perfectly frank. I've, I've never been a fan of Donald Trump. I've always thought he was a fool and a used car salesman, mm -hmm. but, I thank God that he won over Hillary because if we had Hillary, we'd have a war with Russia at this point, you know. And so, I mean, mm, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I look at him as a, as a, yeah. But my point is that, see, who, how do you think we can turn this around so that? Right. Uh, what's your thinking? Because also, uh, Donald I Trump doesn't seem to be, you know, carrying through on his promises. Uh, it, it, for whatever reason, but it doesn't seem that he's delivering, and th that is uh, and something worse. Not enough, and and not in the big actionable ways that he promised. I, I do yeah. agree with you there, but getting to the, the idea of like how do we change this? I, I think that we're taking steps in the right direction, and and and. Uh, to your point of there are a lot of educated people that are buying into this whole multi culty BS, um, referencing some Dr. Jordan B. Peterson um, uh, psychology right now and, and behavioral science, it is this. High IQ people tend to be more open in, in their behavior. They have a higher um, affinity for openness, and that's why you see them um, literally being open with their idea of things like borders and the nation state, etc. It's why you get all these pencil necks up at the UN, like the Michael Ignatius, and, and you know, these these canon, um, you know, texts coming out of all of these these liberals, frankly, on the idea of civic nationalism and open borders, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because they are so open-minded, and that is then plays out into their liberal politics. Whereas, frankly, what's typical among right wingers is that we we like our borders, we like our orderliness, yeah. and and sometimes there is danger to that too, because on the other side of the border, on the other side of the, you know, the, part of the orderliness um, is is a correlation with disgust, and so we're prone to, to being disgusted disgusted by the other, which is something I think that, yeah. frankly, the alt-right as well has to watch out for. But yeah. um, 
So how do we change this? Well, well how did the left change this? They, they did it literally over generations. And the cultural Marxists were not shy about their, their agenda. They were very, very good at documenting what they were going to do. They were going to take over our unions, take over our papers, take over our student unions, take over our classroom. They were going to normalize and move the Overton window on things like um, uh, like homosexuality, making divorces much more easier um, to get a hold of. They said they were going to co-op the feminist movement and the environmentalist movement, um, which, by the way, was just to demonize the cheapest forms of energy so to nationalize them and put us all into poverty on top of everything mm -hmm. um so so i think what we need to do is think generationally as well we cannot forfeit the various elections but we can't make it all about the elections we have to focus on getting our educated young and these millennials and these gen z's i mean if you look at the numbers coming out Many are with us. Mm -hmm. um, these guys have to become professors. They have to become uh, uh, psychologists. They absolutely have to go into the sciences and reports, which will then be cited and then and change the, the, the what, what is considered taboo, etc. And, and we have to continue to press it. You know, in the early 1970s, if you said homosexuality is natural and all gays should be allowed to get married, people would say that is uh, abhorrent, that is unnatural, that is that is just a disordered thing to say. But now, if you say the opposite, you will be ostracized, you might find, lose your job, etc. We have to remember that the Overton window can and indeed has shifted in recent years. And so we have to do everything and weaponize those that are with us um, and, and force them to go out into the public sphere and not to stay closeted because if they do we're going to continue to pardon my French get bent over and get used for the whims of the globalist and 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 that's not what we want folks that's not what we want so so I think we should be emboldened by what we're seeing happening in the White House um, we should continue to, to make sure that this doesn't just you know in and out with four to eight years but but see a, a change within the Republican Party but more importantly within the grass roots and and we do that through affecting the culture and that will not be done in four years it will not be done in eight years but if, if we're not willing to think generationally then frankly islam and the left has a huge leg up on us and we're going to lose in the long run yeah listen i just want to pivot a little bit because you brought up jordan peterson at one point and and mm -hmm. it, we have to talk about the elephant in the room briefly uh mm -hmm. you were supposed to be on a free speech uh, uh panel including uh, gad sad and jordan peterson and you were invited to this uh, to this panel, to join this panel about free speech, and then that offer was unceremoniously rescinded. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and there was a, a kerfuffle about it. And now Jordan Peterson seems to be positioning himself uh, more towards the civic national side of things as opposed to the ethno nationals. Or, let me rephrase that, he used to be sort of like above the whole, uh, you know, inside baseball politicking, but yes. now he seems to be falling squarely on the side of the civic nationalist. Now, first of all, what are your thoughts about this situation uh, with Jordan Peterson? I, I, because on a personal level, I thought it was absurd, okay? Because mm -hmm. they knew about you and, and what you rep represent and the kind of person that you are before they made the extended the invitation. And also, they uh, alluded to the fact that you had been interviewed on a podcast by some uh, uh, hard right, uh, I don't know if it was Stormfront or some... To New it was called the Crypto Report, and it's an affiliate of the Daily Stormer, right. as I understand uh, it. But this was known before they extended the invitation to you, right? Incorrect. So oh. they invited me before that whole kerfuffle in Charlottesville happened. Okay. The initial um, the initial panel was canceled shortly after Charlottesville, uh -huh. and then when they did panel Redux, um, they went forward without me. Basically, they disinvited me from the panel. Oh, I see. Okay, I'm I'm sorry. I didn't I didn't quite. No, it's all good. I wasn't quite aware of the sequence. Okay, so first of all. It seemed to me and struck a lot of people that that it was grossly unfair, especially because the whole point of free speech is to talk to people, especially those people whom we do not agree with, because that way we are able to come up with better ideas as to why we don't agree with them, uh, mm -hmm. even if it were the case of you. So, so what's your thinking of this? Do you think it was justified? I mean, you tell me. Um, well, first of all, I, I will say that I'm under no illusion insofar as, uh, I, I, while I still have a right to free speech, I had no right to be on the panel. So I don't feel sure. like grievously offended and victimized here. Sure. Um, I, I maintain a, a tremendous amount of respect for um, Jordan B. Peterson and what he has done for the movement today, and the movement being free speech and me believing in men, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's no secret that the majority of his audience are young men. Yes. And even I think um, I, uh, guys who are on years too and and I think that that is so important yeah um, and and so I, I think that it, you know 
all of that still stands. When it comes to him venturing into kind of this factional war happening on the right between the Sivnad, the Sivakuks, as we say, versus the <laughs> ethno-nationalists, which I think yep. both of them honestly are, are extreme terms. Um, we have to work on rebranding, I think. Yeah. Um, but but that's besides the point. We'll, we'll, we'll figure all of that out. The same with, you know, alt-right hung out for a little while, then dissident right, and, and we'll, we'll figure out what's going on with the ethno-nationalists. I think we need something that's a bit more marketable, well, yeah. frankly, if we're going to get Joe Six Pack at home to hop on board. Yeah. Um, so for me, I thought that was unexpected. I thought it was unnecessary from my vantage point, but perhaps um, Peterson felt like it was necessary from his own vantage point because perhaps he noticed that a great deal of his audience, um, at least that I can see, um, are in fact folks who identify as eth uh, ethno-nationalists, are indeed folks who are kind of lurpy online and hang out on the hate chan, 4chan, you know, parts of, of parts of, of the, the bowels of the internet. And, and perhaps he was getting some of this feedback and he felt like he had to draw a line in the sand and say, I stand with the individualism stuff and reject the cult uh, collectivization stuff um, or collectivism stuff. I, I stand with the civic hucks and I reject all of your talk about race and ethnicity and, and that was fine um, but but I thought a couple of his arguments frankly were flawed and I would love to engage in debate uh, I'm not gonna put him like I want to debate you now he's already kind of made it clear that, that that's not in his interest publicly and so I'm, I'm not gonna pressure him there but I would love to see him debate with someone who is um, I think well equipped to to give him a run for his money and and you know this business if he tweeted and I'm only paraphrasing here it was something to the tune of the only people who are, you know, talk about their race are people who have achieved nothing with their lives, and you basically shouldn't be proud of something that you did nothing to earn, was the gist of his argument. And I find that so weird. Like, I find it so, like, was my, my late mother not supposed to be proud of my achievements? She technically did not, you know, do the things that I, but, you know, she, she, she was a part of this intergenerational, you know, this is, was I not to be proud of, you know, my dad's, you know, degrees? I, I was not even, you know, a thought at that point, but I'm still proud of the fact that he's gone on to do the good things for his life. So, so I think it's bizarre the idea to say that you shouldn't have any sort of um, pride in, in your heritage. And I say that as a Christian who's like Christian pride, okay? <laughs> and and I think it's a really bizarre argument. And I think that um, I think that it would be great to see him go head to head with someone. I talk about these things. Circling back to the panel itself. The panel was about none of this. The panel was not about ethno-nationalism. It wasn't even about Charlottesville. It wasn't about the alt-right. It was about the most innocuous topic in the yeah. world, free speech, you yeah. know? And we're all are on, I think, on the same page there. Um, and, you know, Gad Satter <laughs> really made things personal after the fact. Yes, that, I found I, that really weird. What's up with that? I mean, well, uh, some e-drama, my friend, some e-drama. Uh, honestly, I, I, I don't care about it. I, I don't appreciate him saying that, you know, basically all of my fans are so-called Nazis and, you know, guilt by association on my part. I mean, that was a little bit below the belt. Yeah. And um, so that was, that was, I mean, silly stuff. That was child's play as far as I'm concerned. But um, No, it wasn't childish. Yeah. It was childish. You know, yeah. not, you know, what the hell is that all about? But yeah, I, I, um, I, I don't quite understand that. Uh, okay, because the, the Peterson thing, I want to circle back to what Peterson said. I do have to admit that I understand that issue about him saying that those people who get disproportionate pride for belonging to a particular race tend to be people who haven't actually done anything and accomplished anything. And they get a, sort of like a puffed up chest. Because in my own case, I have known people who happen to have descended from very famous people or from had aristocratic backgrounds. And, right. and they dust up their, the fact that they are like descendant of so-and-so from way back when, but they themselves are losers, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I've noticed that the people who are, uh, who are descendant of, uh, have aristocratic backgrounds, but who have actually accomplished something in their lives, tend to look back at it and say, oh, that's very nice, but they, they don't get a disproportionate pride. It's the ones who haven't accomplished anything who get a disproportionate uh, uh, boost from it. So that, that point of view is something that I actually understand. Uh, so I understand right. where, where, where Peterson is coming from. It's, I, I think that perhaps it's not an issue that of him denigrating people who are uh, uh, proud of their heritage, but rather who get a disproportionate amount of pride from the fact that they are of this or that ethnic group. Like, right, and I think that wading into the nuance of such arguments, I think, is healthy and good, and it's certainly not lost on me. And I'm not just a black and white sort of gal. Sure. Um, <laughs> pardon the pun. <laughs> um, but, 
but naughty, um, naughty, naughty, naughty. <laughs> but but I, I think that that also saying that it when you look at it from a bird's eye and, and as a net positive, um, I, I think that 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 appreciating your culture, respecting and honoring your culture, and not wishing to wholly sever yourself from your heritage and become something unrecognizable to your roots, whether that be a previous society, whether it be your family, is something that is that, that, that is good. Uh, you know, this idea of continuing, and this is me being a Burkean conservative, frankly, mm -hmm. this idea of, of, of organic evolution as opposed to, you know, the root and graft, put it somewhere else. So, so, so I think that as a whole, um, this idea of cultural and, and, and heritage shame is really, really silly, and I actually find it hilarious when you consider that what the, the Sifnats, the Sivikoks are doing is a, a, another form of cultural pimping, frankly. Mm -hmm. They're saying, you know, forget about the European parts of it, forget about the settlers, For, forget about, you know, the great plains of Abraham's mythology of my country, you know, forget about all of that. Um, Check out my values. Like, like, oh, look yeah. at how great this is, everybody. Come on and buy into this. It's like, well, values we, as values as consumer products to be bought and sold, uh, yeah. like you buy shampoo, which is ridiculous. It's like, oh, I have these values, and oh, let's see if the these values, and let's let's see if we can come to some sort of negotiation, which seems absurd. And also, it seems absurd because the Muslims who are the ones who are coming in. They don't bargain with their with their uh, with their values. They bu they believe in it, and it's something that they carry within them that is, is something hard with them. I'm so happy you brought this up because I wanted to mention this. I was watching one of your videos about the the ship of Theseus and mm -hmm. this idea of can it still be the ship of Theseus if you replace all of all of the, the pieces of wood essentially? And I thought, okay, this is a fantastic analogy, and it really you kind of got got the elements all activated, so to speak. But then I thought about, I think that a more accurate analogy for what we're seeing today is not just the replacement of certain, and indeed soon to be, the, the um, clear majority of the pieces of wood. We're also importing termite colonies. Yes, which, exactly, which, which exactly. You frankly, which, which will eat away at the whole damn ship together. Yes. And, 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 and that's the problem. My, my problem is not about, you know, so much this, Hmm, what is a Canadian? And what pigmentation is their skin and what color are their eyes? No, it's this idea of all of that will be eaten away. All of that is going to go to hell. Yeah. Um, and, and we're seeing that with the European caliphate right now. It's not just like a, and also this idea of, is it Theseus's ship? The, the captains are a changing. When you consider the fact that, that our immigration and refugee minister is himself a refugee. Yes. Yeah. What the hell right? is that all about? Thesis what the hell is that all about? Theseus is not driving the ship anymore. No, We've got the no, enemy it's, it's, uh, it's battalion the ships guy, over there yeah. who've commandeered, you know, our ship. And so all of a sudden you're like, I think that the Theseus ship thing, uh, we've got to get a little bit more nuanced over there. So it's the different captains and the termite colonies that I'm worried about. Yeah, I mean, the, the ship of Theseus was a paradox I would just use as a heuristic to get a better handle on the problem. I loved it. Uh, but, it was oh, very good. Thank you very much. But uh, the, thing that, and th the thing that just drives me a little bit nuts is that the people that they are bringing in are, they, they are anathema to our culture. They don't believe it, they hate it. Uh, I mean, a lot of these people who are carrying out these terrorist activities have come of their own volition. They have come to the Western countries and they come and they decide to just blow shit up after they get to know it because they don't like it. It, it is anathema to their culture. And we see this all the time. And so it, it, I personally think that what has happened over the last 20 years or so, 30 years in so far as immigration is catastrophic for Western Europe and for North America. Living in Western Europe, I can say unequivocally that everything um, west of the oder nisse line, that is Germany, France, uh, Belgium, Holland, uh, the UK, Italy to a certain extent, Spain certainly, Portugal certainly, it's lost. It is mm -hmm. lost. And the demographic numbers, you know, if, if you just look at the actuarial data, in 50 years, uh, uh, the Europeans will be a minority in their own continent. In 150 years, Europe will be a caliphate. The, mm -hmm. the demographic numbers don't lie. Okay, it's, it's, Crusade it's, when, my man. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, it, Crusade it, when. Well, that's we waited 400 years of Muslim raping, pillaging, and conquest, and two thirds of of of, yeah. of Christ, Christendom to be raped and pillaged and destroyed and yeah. Islamified before finally we're like, mm, hey, Pope, yeah. we're ready to go to war, actually. Well, so, is, and this is happening with less than a generation. Yeah, but here's the problem: you see, the Eastern, the Europeans, rather, they are an exhausted people. 
I mean, mm. uh, well, you've what been to she? Europe. You've, you've been to Europe. You've I met... was just there a couple weeks ago. Uh, well, yeah. And, and so you meet these Europeans, and they're, they're Adam's apple bobs, like an elevator on a high rise, right? And they are just weaklings. They, they are, they don't have any gumption. They don't believe, they don't believe in their own country. And they've been taught not to believe in their own country. And the Germans hate themselves. The Swedes are arrogant shitheads who think that they are gonna, you know, gonna open the, their arms to the world and that everybody will love them because of it. I, sorry, I'm, I'm random. No, it's good. No, it's good. I, I think it's so great because you're, you're getting into this other fold, frankly, this, this other part of like the texture of, of the debate over here, because so often folks on the right would be like, Europe, you know, and, and it's like, well, no, actually kind of Europe more so. They're pussies. And, 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 sorry. And, yeah, I'm so sorry and, for being vulgar. I'm so no, sorry for being vulgar. Oh, I always say, you know, part, part of St. Mouth of a Sailor from when he saw me off camera, darling. Um, so, so, um, it's like this, because the, the, the liberal <coughs> multiculties, many of them do gooders and the useful idiots that Lion uh, spoke about, the, the neo-Marxists so obsessed with things like critical race theory and decolonization, and as well the civic huck conservatives have been the ones at the helm of, of not just our parliaments, but also our education system. And so the once great Europeans that now seem to be just, you know, a, a figment of yesteryear, um, they, they have had their culture, their heritage, their proud histories being out of them. I don't think that they're tired so much as they are unmotivated. Um, they, they just kind of think, well, you know, what we had wasn't really worth preserving because we were Nazis. It's like, well, actually, yeah. you were other things too, people, you know? And and I, like, I look at, I'm Greek and Ukrainian heritage, right? Mm -hmm. Greece, all of the islands there, I'm a mainland Greek, my family's from, from the mainland, but all of the islands there are mini Afghanistans and mini like Syrias. And it's something that people talk about, but if you actually come from that place, let me tell you how heartbreaking it is to go out onto the streets where I have beautiful childhood memories of you know being with my late mother and just like amazing, amazing memories. And now it's a, like a refugee camp. People are defecating on the streets. If I, you see someone with a red cross coming up and offering them a bottle of water, they will literally take it and throw it back at them because they have a cross on them. And and you know at what point are we going to say enough is enough? And a, and a lot of these people too are within areas where they haven't yet been affected, right? Like I, I talked to a couple of these these bozos, frankly, when I was in Nuremberg this time last year, and I was like, so what do you think about the migrant crisis, the permanent migrant crisis y'all are in? And he's like, well, we need more workers. The German people aren't replacing themselves. And I was like, my dude, dude. like go rock yourself, please. Like, are you serious? Like, and, and, and this is, this is where the, the, the civic hucks are going to run out of rope because at what point do we say Germany is no longer German? What point do we say that France is no longer French? Well, I think we're at the point where, frankly, the UK is no longer British. No. When you have madrasas and Sharia law and no-go zones, you cannot tell me that my values holds any water whatsoever. Like, you're done. You don't yeah. have any values anymore. There's two systems of government. There's two systems of law. There are, there are two ways of life in there. Do not tell me. Like, you have a country within a country. Yeah. And 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 so I, I think at some point, like, you have to just swallow the red pill that identity does matter. And once you do that, it's going to be really hard to undo that thinking. I know that, and it's difficult. And you're going to go through some ugly parts where you're going to have to reconcile, you know, who you are and what you think. And 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 luckily for my Christianity, I think it helped ground me a lot in this because I don't see myself as, you know, a bigot. I don't see myself as um, like some sort of a supremacist. It's none of that, you know. And and like it's this business. If, if, if frankly, if someone would come up knock on my door, if they were anything. As an individual, of course, I would help them. Like I'm not, I'm not a monster. Mm -hmm. But but at a certain point, you have to say this is about the preservation of of our culture, of our history, of our identity, of our people. And frankly, it's about paving a future for my future. Like, I'm engaged. I want to have kids within the next short little while, you know? Sure. And what am I leaving them where they're going to be a minority? I went to the University of Toronto where I was a, or the University of Tokyo, as we like to call it here. I live in a city which is majority minority, right? right. And like I used to do anecdotal surveys every time I got in the elevator. I was always the only white girl, mm -hmm. always, you know? And I was not in the maths or sciences. I was one of these like, <laughs> you know, liberal arts losers, you know, uh -huh. and so, and, and even still I was a minority, right? And so at some point you have to say, well, you know what? There is such thing as in-group preference. There is something to be said of the fact that I want to live with people who not just look like me, but also who have the same interests as me. As me. And if you don't believe, and it's like that for everyone. It's not just me who says that. Everyone is like that. My, my very best girlfriend, she's a real estate agent in the city of Toronto. 
We just recently went through a boom and we just recently had to put a foreign buyer's tax because everything, all of the, 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 the property here has been bought up basically by um, people from, from China and India. By yeah, they're, they're basically using it as uh, savings accounts. Yeah, exactly. They're basically washing money in this pro yeah. in this city. But anyway, so so she said, Faith, she said, you know what I find so weird? It's not a girl who's particularly political or anything like that, but she kind of knows where I hail from. And she said, you know what I find so weird? I said, what? She said, every single person who's looking to buy a house, no matter what their race, their identity, their ethnicity is, no matter what, what's one question they all ask me? I said, what? She said, what kind of people live in the neighborhood? And I said, well, so what do you tell them? She said, I beat around the bush all day long. Affluent people, middle of the road people. She said, it's not until I say they're ethnicity and or race that people then become satisfied that they've gotten the answer that they've been looking for. And what race do they want? Ones like them. Oh, right. Yeah, of course. And 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 that's what it is. And, and, and the Italians want to live around other Italians. Chinese want to live around other Chinese. And and that's just the way. That's why multiculturalism has become a failed society because it's not diverse. It's not no. truly diverse. No. It's a honeycomb society. We all ghettoize ourselves into these ethnic enclaves, right? Yes. It is instinctual. It is biological. And I'm sort of done with saying let's try an experiment because we did, you know. Yeah. And it didn't work and out. So, it's it. No, no. Uh, I, I am. Look, I like you have. Uh, well, I, you don't have a family yet, but you you plan on having one. I have a family of Inshallah, my own. Inshallah, my friend. And, Inshallah. And my, my concern is that uh, everything in the West seems to be falling apart. Uh, yeah. My thinking is that this might have started with the loss of religion and the First World War. I, I know it seems to be reaching back, but the fact that we have lost faith in God and we have replaced it with science, and science at the end of the day is not an absolute thing. It is a, an issue of interpretation. And if you get the people, the salesmen who can sell the right interpretation, you get what you have now because we have been sold a bill of goods because like you, when I was in college and before, I was like, uh, I had liberal values, quote unquote. And I thought that multicultural, yeah, it seems like a great idea in theory, but actually in practice, you start to realize the, the problems of it. So uh, the, I'm a practical guy or fairly practical guy. And so my thinking is, how do we solve this? Uh, what is it going to take for us to go back to the good old days? Mm -hmm. Can we go back to the good old days? Because realistically, can you ever conceive of a government who decides, okay, everybody who does not have uh, all four grandparents from Canada, back to the country wherever you came from. And that's not going to happen. I, th I think that that's kind of a cartoonish <coughs> and in this business of, you know, uh, physical removal, I think, should only apply to illegals. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not looking at an ethno state. That's not what it is. I'd like to maintain a clear majority, mm -hmm. um, like by a 51% or more. I think that that of Europeans within Canada, at least, like this is just like, you know, and I think that that Germany should be at least 51% German. At least, um, yes. but, but I think that that's a very reasonable, tempered sort of expectation. And then looking yes, at our immigration is. systems, we basically, we flip, we flip the numbers. So whereas right now, within the past 30, 40 years of Canada's history, we've been recruiting from non-traditional sources, i.e. Asia, India, um, uh, South America, the Caribbean, etc. Let's look back to the British Isles, Europe, Scandinavia, and the U.S. Duh, we're neighbors. That'd be nice. Mm -hmm. And so, so um, I, I think that there is like a realistic way of achieving all of these ends that are very, very marketable to um, the masses, so to speak, and frankly, will resonate with those people. I think that you know, physical removal and a white ethno state is a meme, and there are no, there's no way. Even if you believe that, there's absolutely no way you will achieve that with a brutal force. And I'm not interested in that. I'm actually interested in having a very difficult and uncomfortable debate. Yeah. You know, and and putting it to politics. We'll see. Um, so, so there's that. But, but how do we change that? And on the topic of religion, I think you're absolutely right. You know, and, and this business of replacing God with uh, with with science. My idea. They do not need to be, yeah. you know, camps of, of mutual uh, of a self quarantine, so to speak. Um, yeah. If you truly believe in an omniscient, omnipresent, uh, etc., God, then then you believe that His language is indeed math and science, right? Like if He actually created all of this, like He must know something about like mathematical equations. If our five senses and our reason are able to perceive these things and understand them with time, and 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 so so I don't think that they necessarily need to be divorced from one another. But unfortunately, we've allowed our that sort of a dichotomy to to exist in in even just the public sphere. But if you look at the majority of Nobel science winners, I mean, most of them have been believers because you get to yeah. a certain point where yeah. you're like, whoa, yeah. like the, that. At the end this of is the, intelligent yeah. design, you yeah. know, etc. Sorry, but no, no, my my thinking is that. Uh, Look, I'll, I'll, I'm very black pill, I suppose. My thinking is that uh, Western Europe and North America are lost because I've, I've, right now I'm in uh, Hungary 
And here they didn't screw around. They didn't accept any migrants. Uh, they they right. closed their borders tight. And you can see it around Based Bucharest. Or banned. Yeah, I mean, you can see it around Budapest. I mean, uh, you walk around and it is, um, it is Hungarian. Sure, mm -hmm. right now, I, I, we ju I'm just happen to be here at the same time that the Chinese premier is here with his huge delegation. And so you see a bunch of Chinese tourists, but they're clearly Chinese tourists. Okay, uh, emphasis on the word tourist. The, mm -hmm. the people you see here, they're ethnically Hungarian. They're, they're, it's their country and they kept it to themselves. Ditto with uh, Poland, ditto with uh, Belarus and Ukraine and Russia. I'm thinking personally that the West is sort of lost and that Western culture and values will sort of like pass along to the Eastern Europe, uh, the Eastern Europeans rather, uh, because I don't see that the, uh, that the Western European and North American uh, people believe in their own culture. Now, and this breaks my heart because I'm a cultural chauvinist. I grew up in the West. Uh, my family is all Western. I grew up in the United States and in South America. And I have lived in a lot of different cultures. Western culture is the best culture. That's why everybody copies it. They wouldn't be copying it if it didn't work, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Japanese, they, they would not be all dressed in Western suits and ties and act like Westerners. They're, they're, the Japanese are- We'd be in kimonos. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so they recognize it is the best culture. And look, frankly, you know, uh, there is a great difference, a great divide between going to a, um, you know, two, three star, three Michelin star restaurant in Paris and, and eating by the side of the road in some godforsaken jungle in Africa. There is a qualitative difference. And yes, you can respect the African culture, but it is a shitty culture compared to Western, the, the, the culture that the West has erected. And it is being overrun. My thinking, also quite fatalistic, is that simply the Muslims are believers. And at this time, historically, they seem to be a more energetic people willing mm -hmm. to fight for what they believe in. And, and my concern mm -hmm. is that how are we going to get the young people of the West to mm -hmm. uh, pick up arms insofar as Western culture and fight to protect Western culture? Because it seems that everybody's like, oh, I feel and like, I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> Too much soy in our diet, coach. I think so, you know, I mean. I, I, it's not a joke. This is, this is a pincer maneuver. We've, we're, we've been attacked from all <laughs> ends. Um, how, how, do you, how do you get them to fight? Well, well there are going to be fighters and there are also just going to be yes men who frankly um, act as, as, as bodies in no man's land as you're, far you're as I'm concerned. You're talking about Justin Trudeau? <laughs> <laughs> He's a fighter for a different end though. Don't forget, like, or at least his puppeteers are. I, I yeah. frankly, and with no disrespect to the office of our prime minister, I, I doubt that the man has more than two brain cells to rub together. Um, he's a two? former, two? to maybe just one and a half, and one that kind of like you know sparks up every now and then. Um, and and it's no disrespect again to the roles of you know substitute drama teacher. Um, I think he was a former ski. Ski instructor, snowboard ski instructor. Bomb, ski bomb yeah, and substitute right. drama teacher. Right. Um, but the thing is, is that the people behind him, namely one Gerald Butts, and if you don't, if you haven't looked into yeah. him, I'd recommend that you do. Um, these are his puppeteers. These are people who saw the Trudeau name and saw a pretty face, and for some, and um, thought that this is our opportunity to essentially yeah. achieve our nefarious endgame. And that's exactly what they're doing. That's why they have erased our southern border. That's why... They are signing these free trade agreements, or they're about to, with with China. They, that's why you know they they've been part and parcel of so many of the education curriculums across our country, specifically within my home province of Ontario, which is just sick and perverse and like teaches a sex ed curriculum that starts at grade one. Yeah, okay, it's, like this is disgusting. It's disgusting. nuts, right? So so we're we're up against a huge amount of force. But the good thing is, is I do believe in the power of a vanguard, so to speak. Sorry to use Marxist language here. No. I do believe that a manner bond, okay, a, 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 the male bond of a couple of motivated guys really can change the course of history. Yeah. And, and I think that if they, they parcel up their their message well enough they, and, and that they are able to, to really have a go of it in a convincing and a reasonable way and a way that hopefully does not include force because I'm not interested in that business, frankly, um, which isn't to say I'm damn good behind firearm. Um, not a threat, kids. I disavow. Sorry. Um, so, <laughs> so you have to, you know, after that yeah, yeah. podcast, I have to disavow of my own self uh, half the time. Okay. Yeah. So, so, um, so, so all that to say that I, I, I truly believe in, in groups of small groups of a vanguard of, of, of you men. Mean, you that mean a, a Leninist vanguard. 
Uh, I mean, it, look, the, like, if, if it works for your but enemy, like more, there's no... More, m- more in the vein of, like, St. Paul than... Uh, no, no, but, but it, it seems that the, you need a, a certain uh, vanguard that has, like, a, a, the shock troops, the cultural, ideological shock troops that can go out Apostles, and spread the there word. were only 12, Yeah, well, right? I'm, like, it just, 2,000 years later, we're still talking about it. Yeah. I, I really do believe that if you look at, you oftentimes, or back when I was in school, way back when, we talked about, you know, great man theory and right. looking at um, the idea of the development of history through great men. Of course, now we wouldn't do that. Oh, That's no, disgusting. no, no. It's all social history. No. Yeah. Yeah. But I and, look at three... women. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Let's go no, no. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's yeah. all the regions. No, I'm just kidding. But, but um, if, if you look, it's really, it's about the great men, not just a man, right? Yeah. Like you'll find you know, the French philosophes. It wasn't just one guy. It was a bunch of them hanging around at the salon together over, you know, a pack of smokes talking about big ideas. Mm. And from there, even even the, 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 the seeds of the Russian Revolution, right? It was yeah. a bunch of guys underground talking, you know, about where should we go? And of course, from there, you saw the different factions, etc. So, so I really am a huge believer that it's not going to take everyone at first. All it takes is a couple people, a vanguard, to, to again, use just like that nomenclature, to to start to push things. And I think that all of the seeds that we need, I think we've already got enough bodies. It's just about distilling and formulating those ideas in a coherent way and not getting larpy about it. Yeah. Really be cognizant of the way that politics does work, the way that culture does work, and ensure that we can, frankly, install a lot of those guys in the cultural aspects, the political aspects, and then move forward from there. Basically, almost treating everyday life as a focus group as to what ideas work well and and, and being able to refine them as much as possible to make sure we have the, the highest reasonable chance of success. Yeah, you know, I actually never thought of that idea. And that's a very intelligent idea because especially in the certain platforms, social platforms like YouTube uh, uh, and, and Twitter and Facebook, that there are emerging certain people for whatever reason, force of personality, brightness of ideas whatsoever, that are emerging as like people who have strong ideas as to where to go. Uh, and the notion of sort of like assembling them as as the the in a Leninist sense as as the vanguard uh, that would lead the proletariat in in this case right lead the proletariat to the glorious cultural revolution uh, whereby we would uh, bring back the good old days of Western civilization. That's right. Yeah, a it, revolution in the sense of uh, the true sense of the term to return. That's no, what I mean, mean yeah, it's it's a, actually an interesting idea. I never I never considered it. Uh, the notion of a of a fighting vanguard like that that is is devoted to Western civilization and accepts the fact and believes the fact that Western civilization is the best civilization that we currently have and it's worth defending, worth, worth fighting for. Worth fighting mm-hmm. for by any legal means necessary, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say that I feel like we've been almost in this intellectual drought for a little while when it comes to really compelling ideas of political philosophy. Of course, there have been good voices that kind of through their body of work have articulated certain worldviews that are compelling, different, or tilt at windmills. But but I, I, I feel... I feel in the Hegelian dialectic sense of the term, I feel the the antithesis starting to come to, uh, for that, 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 that swims against the tide of this BS thesis that has not been working for so long. It was well, cultural Marxist, multi et etc. And so far as the multiculturalism and globalism is concerned, I, I've spent a lot of time in Switzerland. And uh, mm-hmm. if you've ever been in Switzerland, especially outside of Zurich and Geneva, which are big cities for different reasons, they're, they're, they're uh, global centers of different groups or what have you, if you're in the countryside, it is very much like New England townships. Uh, the localities rule themselves, and it is a much more direct democracy. And what is really interesting and important to me that I've always thought is that, see, uh, everybody has to serve in the military, and everybody has mm-hmm. to uh, spend, I think it's like two weeks. Yeah, everybody has to spend Women as well? Um, I forget. But in okay. Israel, certainly, yes, women yeah. certainly do. <coughs> and the thing is, see, those countries where you have everybody participating in the military and have to, or else they do not get certain rights and, uh, and privileges that an ordinary citizen would have. I think that that's a terrific idea because it makes everybody uh, uh, complicit in their society. Everybody is, is, um, is a part of protecting their society because they have to go and serve. And mm-hmm. by forcing everybody to have to serve, they have to be of a certain physical condition and they have to all go through a certain similar routine. Because one of the things that bothers me very much about the West is this... Um, this atomization of class 
Because yeah. you know, you and I uh, are are we're fortunate enough to be of the top twenty percent of the population in so far as education and in as far as income and in so far as uh, opportunities are concerned. But you see, a lot of people who are in this privileged position, they never meet pe poor people. I mean, mm -hmm. they never see a, a poor uh, a poor neighborhood. They never go there. They never have to spend time there. They never have to deal with poor people or people who are not fortunate enough to have the educational background that you and I have. And so therefore they are become divorced and they look at them on the coast in the United States. People on the coast talk about fly over the country and they talk mm -hmm. about the people who live in the Midwest and the South as almost subhuman. They mm -hmm. treat them with an arrogance that is just remarkable. <coughs> Excuse me. And my thinking is that a common military service would force everybody to rub shoulders for a period of time oh, and realize that everybody has a lot more a, a lot more interconnection a lot more things in common and also would teach people to be more decent to one another insofar as class is concerned because the top classes <coughs> excuse me treat each other horribly and the other issue is of course in so is economic uh one of the things that we have to understand about globalization and the whole multiculturalism thing the multicultural pushes the notion of globalization. Now, globalization has been a great thing because we've been able to uh, take advantage of cheap labor costs in other countries. And so we in the mm -hmm. West have filled ourselves with cheap consumer goods, right? Which is a terrific thing. But it has cost us employment. We have the middle yes. classes and the lower working classes who don't have jobs because all right. the blue collar manufacturing jobs have been exported. Now we have pink collar jobs, that is uh, uh, the jobs for the middle class and lower middle, uh, lower middle class and lower class women. They have those jobs because they are service oriented, uh, nursing, teaching, uh, hair and makeup, what have you. I mean, all of these different professions, the pink collar, they never went away because they can't go away. But the blue collar were shipped overseas. Now my thinking is that perhaps our society would be better off by closing up our borders bringing back those manufacturing jobs and perhaps not being uh, so economically efficient but socially more efficient where you actually have people who have a, a reason for being because I can tell you as a man if you don't have a reason for getting up in the morning you quickly fall into despair yeah. that people men don't mind going and working 12 hours a day if they feel that they are working for a purpose they are working for their families, their, their children, their, their society, their community, we'll call it what you will. But if they don't feel that there is a purpose, that they're just simply marking days with an endless existence that goes nowhere, and if they don't have any certainty about their employment, it is catastrophic uh, on a psychological level. And that's why we have this opioid epidemic and, and the male suicide rate, which is just incredibly dramatic. And nobody seems to be talking very much about it except outliers like you and me. Yeah, and you're so right in saying that because look, if you look at flyover country, which is largely where the manufacturing sectors are located, that's also where the opioid crisis is exactly. highest, and also where the Donald Trump vote is most prevalent, not exactly. on coastal, the coastal elitist America. So all of these things are certainly connected. When it comes to globalization, you're, you're so right in saying, you know, productivity is up, but jobs are down. There is absolutely no way that a person who makes typically, let's say, $20 an hour can compete with someone who is making $2 an hour no. overseas with an inflated currency. You just cannot. The capitalist, so to speak, will go elsewhere. And so for me, that's why economic nationalism is such a great thing and why we totally have to rethink everything with respect to the conservative stance on free trade. And look, like I was there. I get it. I, I used to be one of you guys until finally I was like, Wait, now hold on. Our it's, voting base is getting the most persecuted out of everyone. This is yeah, not cool. Yeah. And I should be I should be defending their interests. Yes. And and I think it's very simple. If it can be made in America, so to speak, then it should be made in in America. And the yeah. way that you do that is that you 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 lay a 30% manufacturing tax on any manufactured goods um, that are being imported more, and you more, also you raise Dude, I love it. That's radical. Let's do yeah. this. Um, but and I think that you you eliminate the corporate tax rate in your own backyard because then all of a sudden what you'll see is corporations will be fleeing to your backyard and they're or running to your backyard rather, and they're going to want to.
set up shop over there and that's going to create more jobs at home and I, and I think that's wonderful because otherwise you're going to have it's a continued um, you know disgusting cycle where we sell raw you know uh, materials yep. for a cost and then it gets manufactured elsewhere while our jobs are basically stolen and then we buy them back for an increased rate yep. and so uh, it, the whole thing is just backwards like it was cool for a little while but now we're just helping other countries industrialize while we're getting getting high and eventually getting dead on opioids. So one thing I would disagree with you in your, in, in your issue there is uh, insofar as corporations are concerned, because I have a very, very dark view of corporations having had to deal with corporations at different levels over the years. And the corporations are not the panacea. And I think one of the big problems is that they have sold the notion that what's good for corporations is good for the country. And that not, is not necessarily mm -hmm. the case. Who was driving globalism? Corporations, especially large mm -hmm. corporations. Uh, uh, my thinking is as follows, and so, so far as corporations are concerned, the bulk of their sales is where they should be taxed. And, and if they, are, they have to, a lot of times what happens with large corporations is exactly what you were saying. They, uh, they export the jobs, then manufacture overseas the good and, goods and services, goods primarily, that they sell in uh, with the Western democracies, and they extract those, uh, those monies, those, that income, to a low taxation environment. For instance, Apple in Ireland. That's why Apple in Ireland has like something like $100 billion just parked there because they didn't have to pay any tax or a minimal tax on it, okay? My thinking is that we have to be much more aggressive with corporations. And we also mm -hmm. have to break up all of these monopolies that are existing. Because you do have to keep in mind, see, uh, one thing that people don't seem to realize is that, see, economically, a monopoly is more efficient, okay? But the problem is that a monopoly or a monopsony, which is a single seller, uh, uh, a monopoly or a monopsy can control the market and dictate how it proceeds, right? Absolutely. And so that's very good because it lowers price, but very bad because that company controls an entire market. And we see that, for instance, in YouTube. In YouTube, there's just one company. Uh, insofar as the tech companies, there are basically four at this point. There's Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and um, I'm, I'm forgetting one. Uh, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, and Google, of course. And those four corporations basically control the internet in the different uh, in the, the different spheres of the internet. This is a catastrophe because each of these huge players is a monopoly player. Amazon, for instance, is rapidly becoming a, a monopoly player in all of retail. This is something that we don't want because Amazon, just by its own decisions, can you know say that oh this little doodad cannot be sold anywhere ever. Period. It's just it can stifle innovation. It can also have the population hostage to its services. And so my thinking is that every monopoly has to be broken, even if it leads to economic inefficiency. Because uh, my concern and my thinking is that ever since uh, neo neoliberalism started to become in vogue in 1980 uh, with Maggie Thatcher in 79 with Maggie Thatcher, what has happened is that it's been efficiency over alles. Mm -hmm. economic efficiency over anything else. But there are values that are more important than economic efficiency. There you are sound social. a little flashy to me, Coach. <laughs> no, but it's true. There, I, I actually, sometimes I think I sound leftist, you know. <clears throat> but my thinking is that there are values that are more important than making money. There are a lot more important. And it is better to, for a society to have fewer consumer goods and, and not have so many cheap goods, but to have a society that has a purpose where every worker has a reason for getting up in the morning and going to work, okay? Mm -hmm. That they are motivated. There is a social good in that. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and my thinking is that corporations aren't going to give that. We as a society have to decide and we have to use the government to focus people in that direction. One of the other things, yeah, I, I sound leftist there, but like one of the other things that no, I'm in favor of. No, you don't. And I, what's, what's, what's funny, sorry, do you mind if I interject for sure. just a moment? Uh, because I think this is where the conversation is heading on the right, which is a much more nuanced view of, frankly, what I, I believe the role of government should be. It's, it's this balance between the individual and the society at large. We've become so hyper-focused on the individual and this atomized society, and part of that is this, this hyper-efficiency and corporatism yep. over 
well, look, wait, where does that where does that leave societal good? Where does that leave the yeah, good exactly, society? Exactly. Where, where, at, at what point can we just say, you know what, government, it's okay, step in. Yes. Because society's suffering right now. And it's so fascinating because I, I refuse to say you know, we're, we're taking moves leftward. It's not. I think this is an evolution of thinking as these various isms, including capitalism, have played, and corporatism have played out over time. We're going to say, okay, let's just check back in with each other, guys. How are we doing? How is this leading our society? And I think it's very healthy and natural natural to to want to strive to have an ecosystem yep. not just not just one person not just one organization yep. and you know i call for the um the regulation of uh, youtube as a public uh, utility recently yep. and a bunch of my you know pardon my, the french but basically <laughs> conservative friends were like fake you sound like a communist i'm like so are, are we are we just like this in this libertarian dystopia of anarchy where like government is just to use up some of our funds once in a while, but we don't actually want them to perform any services? No, government's supposed to step in in order to protect the rights and, and again, that ecosystem society. That's why we have it in the first place. Otherwise, honestly, frick them. Like just for storm the Bastille, we don't need them. But yep. it's for times like this when the corporate interest and and you know capitalism run amok amok begins to eclipse the societal good and and the direction that we are indeed headed towards. Yeah, because my thinking about the alt light, for instance, uh, you know, people like Cernovich, who is a, a classic exemplar, they basically just want to take over uh, conservatism Inc., uh, Republican Party Inc., and. It, go on with the same neoliberal uh, economic policy. I am totally against it. Uh, my thinking is that, like you said, government should step in, should break up these corporations. At, by the same token, and this is a fairly radical proposition, um, the government should not be in the business of uh, creating a social safety net. My thinking comes as follows. Uh, You've, you've heard of Nicolas uh, Taleb, Nicolas Nassim yeah, Taleb, course. right? He wrote mm -hmm. this book called Anti-Fragile, which is very interesting because the, the idea is very simple. Like all really great ideas, it's very simple. There are things that are fragile. That is, you know, if, if they exist and if you put pressure, they break. There are things that are robust, for instance, like a barbell. You put mm -hmm. pressure on it, it's not going to break, it's not going to change. But there are things that are anti-fragile. That is, the more pressure you put on them consistently, the stronger they become. Now, mm -hmm. a simple example of this is uh, your muscles. You know, your, your, your bicep, you know, you, you do some, uh, uh, you know, some curls with a barbell, you know, you do five kilos every morning, you know, you do 30 reps, and then you up the ante a little bit, and by a month's time, two months' time, you're, you're going to be able to curl 30 kilos per arm, no problem. Because Another good example is the church. This yeah. idea of through the blood of the martyrs, yeah. it's the seed of the faith. Yeah, exactly. So my thinking is that the government should step, should get out of the Bismarckian notion of providing social welfare because we are clearly seeing that it hurts the people. It makes them too fragile. If we're mm -hmm. truly on our own and we have to depend on each other and there is only private charity, no government charity, no, no government stipend, forget about it, anything as crazy as, as a basic income. I'm talking eliminating Medicare and Medicaid and everything and just throwing it overboard and just forcing people to look after themselves and look after one another. Mm -hmm. it, of course, there's short-term pain, and there are going to be a lot of cases that it's going to break our hearts, but the thing is, in the long term, it'll be beneficial for our society. It will be a stronger society because of the pressure that everybody's going to be under to make it on their own. Uh, well, that, that, that is the way that it used to be, right? The church exactly. is the one who used, to, who used to provide certain sources, whether whether it be um, through education, through hospitals, and of course the family was the original social security net where there was such thing as generational wealth so people didn't have to worry about you know saving yeah. for this and pensions for that because you know yeah. we all just kind of took care of each other. Um, I remember when I took uh, six months off of work to, to take care of my, my, my ailing mother and folks were like, well, why are you doing that? Aren't you worried about work and doing a lot? I said, no, like this is- It's more important. Yeah, I, it's more like, important. This is, my, yeah, this, is my, this is my responsibility. This is the way it's done. She took care of her parents when they they were sick and I'm taking care of my parents when they're sick, you know, yeah. the same way she took care of me when I was a baby, you know, that's yeah, exactly. just the way that it works. And, and there's this, there's this loss of, of an idea of, first of all, the family as a social security net, but also um, private institutions, if you will, in order to achieve, I think your, your goal, you need a private public um, kind of a partnership 
to begin with before you kind of are able to get everyone off of the government teat. But um, Pro- I certainly yeah. do. Yeah, and, right. and ideas like unions and these sorts of like um, almost like male fraternities like the Knights of Columbus and so on and so forth, these sorts of things used to exist and do in, in varying shades. And, and, and I do I do believe in a limited social security, public social security system. I will say that. And I am a bit a Rawlsian here, which is to say that I do believe that there is a place for taxation and tax dollars to go for ser- to serve the very least well off in society, either mm-hmm. through a physical disability. Let's say, you know, Joe Sixpack at home goes, fights in a war, loses a leg. His wife, you know, won and basically cucked him while he was away at war. He doesn't have any family or friends. Someone should look after that guy. You know yeah, what I mean? Sure. Like he served our country. And so and so I do believe that we should look after the least well off in society, specifically those who were kind of born into that, you know, someone who might be born handicapped in some way and they're, they come from a, a family of very low income. And, and I don't want people being like, I'm not a Spartan in that sense. Like, I, I do not believe we should be leaving, you know, ill children on the side of a mountain. Like, that's not, I'm not okay with that idea of society. Uh-huh. I do believe, again, that government exists there for a reason, but I think that this this idea of fundamental human rights and care for the least well-off in society has evolved into this leviathan of entitlements and yeah. and you know human rights have become entitlements like, like yeah. it's just and it's so ridiculous and, yeah. and we've and we were just importing this next generation of voters and entitlement you know cheat suckers and and entitlement payers and and the whole thing is just going to continue to mushroom out of control it has I, mushroomed I say, out of control I should say I only have six percent of my battery left, and I'm a boomer, and I don't know how to to connect all of these things and my battery at the same time. Okay, so I guess we we should be winding it down, but I just want to say that it's it's been a terrific conversation. And, this is very cool. Uh, yeah, and we should definitely do uh, another one. And uh, I'm planning like on having that. like a like a live stream with uh, yourself, and I'd like to invite you over to a live stream with some other people, and would, I think it would be a lot of fun. But, uh, you know, Faith, it's been a, a terrific conversation. And, um, yeah, is there anything you want to leave us with before we close out the show? To quote my favorite saint, pray, hope, and don't worry. That's Padre Pio. I, I really do think we have to reinvigorate um you know, everyone focuses so much on the temporal and physical strength. We forget sometimes about intellectual and, and spiritual strength. And if we really do want to save the West, as they say, um, it, we're going to have to incorporate some of the spiritual uh, spiritual fortitude as well. And, and remember that after the Roman Empire fell and, you know, we went into the so-called Dark Ages, if you believe in that, although, you know, there's an argument to the contrary, that it was the church that helped uplift us out of that. So, so I do believe that things are going to hopefully, God willing, come into some sort of jiving going forward. And we're able to establish this vanguard and hopefully help turn the tide of history um, towards a, a more hopeful horizon. Other than that, check me out on YouTube, Faith Goldie. <laughs> Subscribe, tell your family and friends. Yeah, you, by the way, uh, for our viewers, you're going to be developing your channel more. Is that correct? Yeah, one should hope so. I have no editorial skills, by which I mean like actually editing. Yeah. And uh, I am a boomer, but I'm figuring it out. I can write, I can read, and hopefully, God willing, according to you know whatever you might think, talk to camera. And so <laughs> it's just it's the technical stuff. Just h- hang in there, folks. I promise you, it's going to be aesthetic soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think that yeah, because you're, the last video you put up was really good. It was just uh, Thanks, I it was just it. fire and brimstone, and you got the job done. And so congratulations. I think it's going to be really good. So anyway, um, Faith, it's been a delight talking to you, and uh, this is Coach Redpill signing off. So I just want to say thank you very much, and I'll see you soon.